Hello and welcome to a special year-end edition of the France 24 debate. I'm François Picard. Back in November, when world leaders gathered under Paris's Arc de Triomphe to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, Donald Trump's late arrival reminded us that the world order we've, been growing, we've grown up with is uh, changing, just as sure as everyone experiencing upheaval, new powers like China emerging, automation changing the workplace, the environment. For some, the change is an opportunity, for others, the threat. Roll back to 100 years ago. The end of what was billed as the war to end all wars seemed like a chance and a fresh start. The world must be made safe for democracy, had said a very different U.S. president at the time, Woodrow Wilson. So what can we learn from 1919, the year the winners redrew the map of Europe and the Middle East? You might say it was also the year when it hit home that farm boys that marched off to war would never return either because they'd been killed or because technology was moving jobs from the country to the city. What lessons can be learned from that upheaval or from the never again disgust felt by those who somehow survived serving as cat and fodder? We'll be asking about the individual's place in society back then and now. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at a whole new world, the whole new world of 1919. And with us to talk about it, Francisca Heimberger, uh, who is a uh, professor at uh, the University of Paris-Sorbonne. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. A uh, thanks as well to film historian Glenn Myrant, and uh, who's part of your specialty is uh, the silent era. Uh, w welcome to the show. Uh, joining us uh, as well, historian Curtis Young. He teaches literature at ESSEC Business School, working on a, a, a major project with the Smithsonian in Washington on uh, the blacks who fought in World War I. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. And um, 2019 happens to be the 100th anniversary of Israeli newspaper Haaretz. Editor-at-large Dov Alphon is the man in charge of commemorations. Indeed I am. Thank you for having we'll, 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 we'll talk perhaps a bit more about, uh, about the, what was happening. When was it? June? 1919. June 1919. There we see uh, the cover of the, yes. uh, <laughs> of the first edition, published not in... What is today Israel? No, it was in Cairo. Uh, you know, the, the Middle East was so different, and uh, Zionists like 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 our it's newspapers uh, uh, owners thought really that there would be one region going from Damascus to Cairo, and everybody will live peacefully and hopefully read our <laughs> it's okay. Well, different times, and we'll talk about the redrawing of that map in a bit. And all year, you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag, hashtag F24Debate. It was the day after the armistice in 1918 that the great Impressionist painter Claude Monet wrote to his friend, Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau, to offer the French state a monument to peace. The panels that make up Monet's waterlilies can be seen at Paris's Orangerie Museum. They are indeed an ode to a much-needed peacefulness after four years of war. They're also the work of a 79-year-old man. Impressionism was a 19th century movement. Emerging instead was an anti-war movement that found its inspiration inward, in our dreams. German Dadaist and surrealist Max Ernst painted Aquis Submersus uh, in 1919. You already, during the war, Francisca, start to see that uh, the arts are changing in, re in reaction to what's going on. Yes, you see art changing, and you see art changing because artists have been mobilized. You see everything, for example, that happened around camouflage. You see the various directions that that went in. You had artists who were mobilized in the French section for camouflage, abstract artists. And then you have also the artists who weren't mobilized, who were experiencing what people were telling them about the front and who start to reintegrate that into their, into their art. So you see all sorts of different changes happening depending on where the artists were at which point during the war. Last month, when we had those commemorations, we talked about the relief people felt in, uh, in November of 1918. What was the mind frame at the outset uh, uh, of 1919 of ordinary citizens? It's quite a complex one because, yes, I think relief is the, is the right term that, that you're using there. People talked about, you know, should we be celebrating a victory? But relief, I think, was something which was probably more shared than celebration at that time. People were mourning the dead. Um, people were recovering from this this long stage this long period of the war and they were starting to look out towards 
new options, but at this stage in 1919, beginning of 1919, it's still all very uncertain. Um, nobody knows what's going to happen further east. Germany is in turmoil. Um, the Russian Revolution is not long past, and nobody's quite sure what will happen in the civil war out there. So we're still looking at a very uncertain world at this point. So was it more the fresh start mentality or the uncertainty that you described? Well, the two tend to go together. Um, what with the, a lot of questions being very much unsettled at this point, um, it was definitely a fresh start needed, and people were quite worried about what new order could be created to um, constrain all of these uncertainties. A couple of years back, uh, Curtis, you joined us on this very set to talk about the Harlem Hellfighters mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the fact that during World War I, you have these African Americans who are not looked down upon as second-class citizens here, but who, are, who fought br fight bravely mm -hmm. alongside the French uh, and, the, and the British and the Americans, uh, in, mm -hmm. the other Americans, in, in World War I. What is their mindset? At the at, end. At the beginning of 1919. At the beginning of 1919, uh, there, there, there are a number of things that are going on. One, they have done an incredible job. They were part of the 16th Division, 4th French Army under, under Henri Gouraud. Uh, they had won Croix de Guerre. They had won the Légion d'Honneur. Uh, they had really, uh, really shown their mettle. And they were ready to go back home. Uh, with this with this victory mm -hmm. and and they were faced immediately here in France in fact with the with the idea that number one you're not participating in the victory parade these black soldiers were not allowed to 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 march along Whose the order was that? Say. this was under the order of Woodrow Wilson mm -hmm. uh, carried out by 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 John John Pershing uh, number one they were they were it was suggested that these soldiers take off their uniforms before they go back home because they didn't want Americans to see black guys coming back with, with, the, with the military uniform. And when they go back, there are these terrible race riots. It's, it's incredible. Uh, 1919 is known as Red Summer. Uh, there were riots in every major city, Chicago, uh, New York. Uh, uh, a young Josephine Baker saw these riots in East St. Louis, where she was growing up as a child. Um, th th there were lynchings. The Ku Klux Klan had been reanimated in 1915, thanks to D.W. Griffith's movie, uh, The Birth of a Nation. And they were determined that these soldiers were going to be put back in their place when they, when they, when they came back to, uh, back to America. So it was, it, was, it was really quite a conflict. Glenn Myron, to, as a native Chicago, and do, do people remember this, this period of history, or is this something? World that, War I? No, but what happened <laughs> in, in Chicago in 1919, for instance, is that something that, that comes up? Uh, not to my knowledge. I'm sure it does, but... In this day and age, I don't think so. This is news to me. Mm. I, I had no idea. Mm. But you're absolutely right about Birth of a Nation and the effect that that had uh, at the time yeah. and, and still today. I mean, yeah. for, for so long, uh, there was a huge movement to ban the film, not show it. Mm -hmm. um, it needs to be shown. It needs to be clearly stated what it is. And, well, and it's, uh, it's a great example of a feature film in the middle of the war. Well, the thing is, 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 is interestingly enough, Birth of a Nation was made a film from the play, it was from the, the book. The Klansman. The Klansman, mm -hmm. by, who was, and Dixon, who wrote this, was a classmate of Wilson at Johns Hopkins. They were close. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you look at the film, many of the titles, the historical references, are from Wilson's history of the American people. And, and it was the first film ever to be screened in the White House. Mm -hmm. uh, and Wilson called it history written in lighten, lightning mm -hmm. uh, and said that it was all true. And interestingly enough, the burning cross that the Ku Klux Klan, that's their, 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 their symbol, if you will, was not something that they had done. Griffin used that as a cinematic effect in the film, and the Ku Klux Klan adopted, adopted. it mm -hmm. af afterwards. And so... Uh, so, so this, this, this idea of, 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 again, trying to put the genie back in the bottle mm. is something that started before World War I, was continued through World War I, and it's, it's continued just today. So, so it's, it's hard to, to find these particular iconic moments, given the fact that this, this kind of history has, has continued. So uh, the, the world is changing. There's a nativist <clears throat> backlash. Mm. Does that sound familiar to you, Dovah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, every time there is a huge progress, uh, 
uh, socially speaking, there will be a backlash because there are people that are not satisfied with us moving on. And so we saw it in 1919 when, when black soldiers suddenly fought for America and, and we can see it today. In my opinion, it's all a backlash about you know, Obama's uh, in the White House, about social rights for, for women, uh, and, and even the Harvey Weinstein affair, all these kind of uh, really uh, confront uh, people with, with their own racist ideas. And they decided that they preferred their the racist ideas uh, and, and not social progress. So yes, I think there are a lot of resemblance, yes. Part of 1919 is the Treaty of Versailles, of course, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we can uh, talk about that I I in a moment. But first, uh, the biggest among the biggest hits at the box office in 1919, French director Abel Gans's J'accuse, mm. the story of two men who love the same women, woman and uh, meet in the trenches uh, of, the, uh, of the First World War. Uh, Glenn Meyer, the, this was a huge hit at the movies. It, it absolutely was. Um, Abel Gans uh, is part of a group of French filmmakers after the war that really revitalized French cinema. Marcel Herbier, Jean Epstein, Louis Deluc. Louis Deluc was a film critic at a newspaper, started cine clubs, started uh, film reviews, and started making films. He what struck a chord with this movie? Uh, well, it's in the immediate aftermath of World War I. How could it not? Mm. Uh, you have to keep in mind that during the war, uh, we're in an era where there's no television, there's no radio yet. All people get their news from are newspapers and newsreels. So Pate, the big French company, which still exists today, their big thing was newsreels. So people could see, actually, in the theaters, week in and week out, censored, but some of what was going on. And so immediately in the aftermath of the war, this was absolutely the first big production. Abel Gans is the guy who went on to make Napoleon in 1927. This is the era of the 10-year period after the war where it's the golden age of f French silent films. Mm -hmm. for, for Francisca, the 1919, the year of the Treaty of Versailles, and we get to the to, to the heart of it because there is. We talked at the beginning about that mix of anxiety and optimism. Mm. The optimism is felt by those who redraw the map of Europe uh, and and the Middle East. Um, uh, on the continent, we begin what there's. Uh, we begin World War One. There's still the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, Czarist Russia shares Poland with Germany, uh, and uh, we can see, uh, if we call up the map, how uh, uh, the, the world of 1919, there's the world of 1914, uh, <laughs> is, this, is the, the opening of all these nation states. Yes, absolutely. 1919 is the moment when the map of Europe gets redrawn. And, and you're absolutely right to mention the end of the empires and the beginning of all these nation states, because one of the things that has to happen that happens in the negotiations of the Versailles Treaty is splitting up these empires, deciding who gets to go where, deciding which populations get to go where. And that includes referendums in various places so that they can decide where to draw the borders, to decide who belongs to which country. And in some cases, that's fairly arbitrary. Some some cases, it's pretty political. It's strategic, depending on, you know, where, where borders make sense to various other countries. So these are these are decisions, and they're based sometimes on, on up-to-date statistics that have been raised after the war. Sometimes they're based on old statistics, Austro-Hungarian statistics, deciding on, you know, which populations live in which, which area. It's always a gray area, and they have to decide, at least temporarily, where they're going to fix the borders. And uh, there's also the, this promise of creating a League of Nations. Yes, well, this was the idea of creating a framework which would enable peace to be more durable after the First World War, to come up with some, some kind of superstructure that would enable countries to maintain the peace that people were hoping for and that they hoped would be durable. Now, obviously, we all know that didn't work out in the end, and it's not until a lot later that we start to have the kind of international structures with the power to actually enforce this, but it was a first attempt, and at that stage, people were quite hopeful as well, and they hoped that this would be a new way of, of maintaining peace in Europe. With our eyes of uh, people who are living on the cusp of 2019, mm -hmm. how do you explain the fact that um, the U.S. Senate refused to ratify the Treaty of Versailles and 
refused the idea of joining the League of Nations. It was all an anti-Wilson uh, move. Um, Wilson was only the second Democratic president since before the Civil War, Grover Cleveland mm -hmm. and, and Wilson. The, the power uh, in, in, in Washington and politics were, were Republicans. Uh, they were the ones who, uh, it's the party of Lincoln. Mm -hmm. These were the industrialists. And, and, and Wilson, uh, of his mindset, refused to include any Republicans in the work that he was doing around this. So therefore, they just stood silent and said, that we're not, we're not going to support anything that Wilson does. They're, it was sort of like Mitch O'Connell. Today, their idea was, was we're going to make sure he fails. Mm. Uh, so that was part of it. The other part of it that's interesting about the, the, this, the, the 14 points in the League of Nations is it's also open up a, a new conversation about the relationship with the colonies and about racism. Mm. The Japanese tried very hard to have a, a, uh, a, a plank uh, in, in Versailles against racism. Because the, the Japanese were facing such severe racism in America, they thought this was an opportunity to, to, to put an end to this. W.E.B. Du Bois and a man by the name of William Trotter, a black man who was the editor of a, of a, of a newspaper in Boston called The Guardian, came to Versailles also to bring forth the, the, the idea of, of civil rights. Uh, Ho Chi Minh. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, was was there, who was looking for uh, recognition for his country mm -hmm. as well. So all of these conversations began to happen in 1919 uh, at, at, at Versailles, and they continue to resonate. These conversations, we, we, we've, we've not... And this idea of global governance is born, but in a way, as we as, as Francisco was describing, it's stillborn shortly thereafter. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I read the 14 points for the mm -hmm. first time in my life day before yesterday <laughs> and it and it looks like it looks like an an outline of neoliberalism mm. it, it wilson was really looking at the place that america was going to play on 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 the on the national stage so it's 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 more or less a hegemonic document right uh it it, it begins this the, where we are today in in, in 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 an interesting kind of a way. So it's not an act of benevolence at all. <laughs> right. at, no, not at all. The very the, the, the second of the fourteen points it has to do with uh, free trade. Mm. Uh, the, that the sea should be open. That uh, basically that that we the powers should continue to have to, to have these powers so so this idea this idea of who's going to play the hegemonic role on the world stage is an is 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 one that we're still we're still confronting yeah winners rewrite the rules we're going to see how that applies to the middle east when we come back stay with us you're watching a special year end edition of the France 24 debate Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's a special year-end edition of the France 24 debate. Uh, as we get ready for 2019, we're looking at the upheaval of 1919. We're doing so in the company of uh, historian Francisca Heimberger, who teaches at the University of Paris, Sorbonne. Welcome back. Welcome back as well to film historian Glenn Myrant, uh, the Curtis historian Curtis Young, who teaches literature at Essex Business School, and Dov Alphon, editor-at-large, for the Israeli daily newspaper Haaretz, we were seeing at the outset of the show, which is uh, celebrating its 100th anniversary. Indeed. W what's in the first edition of Haaretz, by the way? Um, well, w you can see the dream. You can see the power of the dream, because they feel um, the first Zionist with a liberal newspaper, they feel like peace is at hand. Uh, the world now has understood, uh, understands that he, 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 ma everything must be really uh, 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 much more uh, peaceful. And you can see also that countries are born and distributed to peoples around the Middle East. So the Jews evidently thought, OK, we're the next ones. And, and you can see the dream and the passion from the very first page of our newspaper then. Mm. It's it's a it's a it's a Zionist dream. Yes. Uh, yes. Is it yes. is it fair to say it's a left wing Zionist dream? It was at the time more liberal than 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 left wing in European term. It, it was for uh, liberty. For example, the, the main editor in chief during all those one hundred years was Gershom Shokin, uh, and and he believed that Jews should marry 
Arabs, Palestinians, if they feel in love, and, and uh, this could lead, in, in his views, to, to a more interesting and peaceful country. And, uh, and he came with those liberal ideas influenced by German universities and French universities. So it was really a liberal newspaper from day one, yes. Mm -hmm. In the Middle East, if we turn back to 1914, it's the Ottoman Empire that's ripe for the chop with the end of a dynasty that ruled the region dating back to 1299 in parts. Legend has it that it was a ruler drawn on a map that determined how the French and the UK would carve up the Middle East with the secret Sykes-Picot Treaty of 1916, which was enacted uh, after the war. Uh, Dov Alphon, uh, when we commemorated last month uh, the uh, 100th anniversary of the end of World War One, we were speaking with... Uh, uh, Palestinian journalist um, Abdel Bari Atwan, mm. uh, who said for him it's another Nakba, another catastrophe, uh, the, uh, the ca that carving up uh, well, uh, of the Middle East. Certainly. First of all, uh, they, they decided there is such country called Transjordan, mm -hmm. and they gave it to, to the brother of another king, mm -hmm. and they decided there's a country called Jordan. Well, in fact, this territory belongs to Palestine that one day will be parted between Jews and, and Palestinians. But half of this country was suddenly ruled by those two guys in the sand and, and from others, of course, political and uh, allies and, and powerful nations to, an, to a third country. And, and so suddenly, the already 50% of your territory is off. So when, <clears throat> what was the logic behind uh, this map? Um, everything you see is, is really, um, uh, I can see here three letters. I can read them. It's oil. O-I-L. <laughs> and this is what was really the logic of almost everything in this drawing. They already understood that Iraq, they, they couldn't understand yet the power of oil and the, the multi-billion industry. Otherwise, there would have been not one million casualties in the Middle East, but probably three million. Mm -hmm. But they understood that it's a powerful economic factor, and everything here is for oil. Uh, and the British and the French wanted Iraq and, and wanted parts of the Ottoman Empire that would be uh, rich in oil, and this is the reason for everything, really. So, Francisca mm -hmm. Heimberger, you're in the room with uh, Sykes and Pico. How would you draw that map? <laughs> Oh, I haven't got any solutions to that. Um, but it's a really interesting question because it's a period when they start to um, enlarge, if you want, the panel of people who get to discuss this because it's not just diplomats. They ask anthropologists, they ask social scientists, they're starting to mobilise historians to f basically find answers. Now, obviously, it didn't work out in this case. In this case, as, as, as you quite rightly said, it's economic reasons that are probably a large part of the answer. It's diplomatic reasons for certain for strategic questions. But we're starting to enlarge the panel of people who get a say on this, who start to influence discussions. Um, there are scientific reports that are compiled, certainly for the European borders that are redrawn. So we start to see a more nuanced discussion for some of this. And, and those borders, by the way, and you mentioned a little bit in part one of our discussion, Curtis Young, mm -hmm. they come bumping up against territories which are colonies of mm -hmm. Western powers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of the things that's happened with those borders, of course, is dividing the same people mm -hmm. from each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and uh, for example, the relationship between Syria and France and, and, and Lebanon and France. It, uh, both French protectors. Both, both, mm. both French pr protectors. And, and the idea, as, you know, going back to the idea that O-E-L <laughs> is, 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 is written all over this, is the, the people that were there were of no consequence. Mm. There, there it is in a nutshell. They were of no consequence. Uh, uh, they were going to serve this project uh, in, in, in any way that the Britain, France, and the United States uh, uh, deemed, uh, deemed necessary. The war ends uh, with uh, uh, women earning the right to vote. In the UK, Germany, in 1920, the United States would follow. It would take another world war, by the way, uh, for France, which would wait until <laughs> until uh, 1944, but it was a um, it was the cusp of also a difference in the way uh, women are perceived and the way women earn their rights, uh, Glenn Myrant. And you 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 you're saying that uh, in the film industry, uh, it wasn't always two steps forward, one step backwards. Before World War I, uh, there were people like uh, Alice Guy, 
who was uh, Léon Gaumont's secretary in 1895, saw the first Lumière projection in Paris and went on to be head of production. Uh, the first short fictional films that were made for Gaumont were made by a woman. And then in 1907, she moved to New Jersey, of all places, and opened up a branch of Gaumont, and then eventually opened up her own studio called Solex, and uh, made close to a thousand films. Mm. And uh, there's a new documentary about her by Pamela Green, which is coming out this coming year. And it shows very clearly that by the end of World War I, uh, the powers to be, the big studios, uh, both in the United States and France, realized that, you know what, we can make a lot of money with this, um, these movies. And after World War I, more and more feature length films over an hour were being produced. Some women were involved. There's a French woman named Germaine Dulac who just after World War I started making films for Gaumont. And uh, she's probably the leading film, woman filmmaker at the time. But uh, by the mid-20s, uh, women in key positions as editors, as production designers, as writers. Uh, 1919 is the year of United Artists being founded, and one of the co-founders is the actress Mary Pickford. Correct. That's the exception to the rule. <laughs> why, why are... I guess because so today there are still a minority of women who are directors. Uh, well, Not so much in France. I mean, France mm -hmm. is definitely in the avant-garde, uh, the vanguard of, of, of women in film, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. especially the long tradition. Why is storytelling taken away from them? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Francisca Heimberger. Um, I don't know. It's an interesting question. It's a debate we've been having in France as well. Why, why there are few, so few women historians visible in public debate in France and in other countries, in mm. fact. Um, I think the tides are starting to turn, but it's a very slow debate and we're, we're slowly getting there, I think. But How do you uh, explain the rise? The, the, 1919 should be the culmination, right, of the suffragette movement, and yet, well, and yet know, it's not. Well, it's a complex one, because on the one hand, you have women having occupied positions during the war in the absence of men, um, in both in France and in Britain. There are various evolutions that happen in the workplace at this time, but there's also the question of what would happen when the men return, because you then have to start, you have to reintegrate men into the workplace, you have to reintegrate often men who have been wounded, men who have got physical um, handicaps after when they come back after the war, so you have to find a new way of reintegrating them. You can't just roll the clock back and pretend the war didn't happen, but um, if you, you can't just maintain all the women where they were when the men come back. So there's a difficult negotiation that needs to happen in the various countries. They don't always cho choose the same options, but it's something which has to be renegotiated after the war. So it's not just a case of progress during the war, which then continues. It's much more complex than that. So my own grandmother, born in 1907, why did she have to wait till the age of 34, I believe, to, uh, to, to get the right to vote? Well, it's not, not the people who wanted the vote who got to decide, so it's always a, it's a question of when, when, the, when, the, when so the decision... Why was behind the times on this? Uh, that, that's a very complicated <laughs> question. <laughs> it's a question of, of, of perception of, uh, perception of identities mm -hmm. and what that will mean for the political game, because at that stage, the left, for example, in France, were worried that giving women the vote would count against the left mm -hmm. because women would vote what their, either their husbands told them or their priests told them, and therefore um, that would w vote against. So that meant that the left, who were more, pro progress, were more in favor of progress, were not necessarily in favor of the vote of women. So it's, it's a complex question mm -hmm. at that time. And she, my, by the way, my grandmother quipped that she never voted the same way as my grandfather. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as uh, did many. <laughs> uh, communications uh, were also changing. We, we, we heard from Glenn in, in part one of our discussion how at the outset of the war uh, the mass medium of choice is the cinema uh, some of the artists of the time like the Belgian surrealist René Magritte came from the advertising world uh, film and print would soon have a, a new mass media rival. Europe's first entertainment radio program would start emitting from the Netherlands in 1919. The first big private radio stations uh, would be soon to follow. Uh, Dove Alphon, when you see there's a change in mass media in 1919, mm -hmm. we're also under, in the throes of a change in mass media right now. And what, what can yeah. we learn from then? Well, first of all, um, I think that it was much more slow during those years. People didn't rush to buy a new iPhone radio set. It was expensive. 
and and uh, so it took a lot of time for, for the mass media to change really uh, when Aritz was born just after the World War one uh, newspapers were sometimes printing five editions a day you know it's something that for today seems like science fiction and and, and they were still very powerful and it was believed that government heads, it's important people were reading newspapers editorial and were not listening to radio shows. But it, it changed a lot, it changed slowly, but it changed suddenly. And we can see the immense influence of the first uh, discourse viruses in the new media because the elites do not understand immediately that there's a new thing. And so, yeah, Georges uh, Clemenceau, for instance, the French Prime Minister, he, was, he, he hated having to speak on, uh, on radio, and he believed in L'Aurore, the, the, the newspaper yeah. he, he had to found. So, so yes, exactly. And this is why in this vacuum, in this emptiness, without any elite, without any knowledge, uh, who, who enters the first are generally uh, people who are not satisfied with the course of the social progress. Mm -hmm. And this happened then, and it's certainly happening now. Mm -hmm. Radio is about to come, and uh, just as today some people say, ah, oh, social media is what spawned the Arab Spring or the, mm -hmm. the election mm -hmm. of Donald Trump mm -hmm. in 2016, Back then, with radio, people said, well, that, that was a, a marker. One man who understood the power of radio was Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. uh, and would you say that the, it's the mass media change mm -hmm. that matters, or is it the, the ideas and the politics? It's, it, I, I think they work together. It's interesting that you mentioned, mentioned Hitler, because, because one of the things that happened during World War I is that Woodrow Wilson put together the most sophisticated propaganda entity that had ever been created under an old advertising man, George Creel. Mm -hmm. he, and, and George Creel cre was the head of the Office of Public Information. And, and this is how he was able to convince America, for example, who was against the war. From one day to the next, we suddenly have an America who is all for the war. So one of the things that we began to discover in World War I was the power of media in terms of, of, of conveying the national narrative. And, and, and controlling it and keeping it intact. And so film played a huge role in this, uh, going beyond into, into, World War, into World War II. Film played a huge role. And we began to see radio, the role that radio could play in terms of, of uh, uh, diffusing the national, what was the national narrative going to be. And that's what we're dealing with now. Because it's, it's, it's a question of who's going to control that narrative, the people, who are in, engaged in that narrative? A, a few weeks ago, we had the 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the yellow vest dem demonstrations, which is a movement of people, and 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 how how then do we control the narrative when we have people who have access to the microphone, mm -hmm. to the to the to the bullhorn, if you if you will? So when when the the lone audiovisual mass media is film, is it easy? to control that narrative? With the newsreels, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, week in, week out, mm -hmm. uh, until radio began really mass, in a mass scale in the early 20s, it was the only source other than newspapers, but as far as the masses, people who didn't read, people who, it was inexpensive to go to movies, that was the, it was entertainment for the masses. Mm -hmm. And so the people that now have the power because they have access to the internet, mm -hmm. Those are those people, the equivalent back then. Like how much, how much influence would a film like uh, Sergei Eisenstein's Battleship Pachemkin, which was uh, hailing the virtues of the, the Soviet uprising in, 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 in 1917, how, how much impact would that have compared to a, a Facebook movement or whatever today? Uh, funny you should mention that. I was just thinking, as you were saying, Curtis, about uh, the effect of, of radio. I was thinking about Lenin, and Lenin said basically that the that film is the most important of the arts, is the most mm -hmm. important mass medium, mm -hmm. because it can communicate to people who don't who are illiterate, mm -hmm. uh, who just go to the movies, and they can be affected by it. The Battleship Potemkin, I think, is more of an intellectual type of exercise, at least view, viewed from today. Mm. Um, it, for the longest time, it was, it was, uh, it was banned in France uh, when it first came out in 1925. And it was in, in Russia, I don't have any figures at hand, but how many people actually saw it? Probably millions. 
But um, what kind of effect did it have? I don't know. I don't know. Mm. And this idea of who, who controls the, the, the narrative for the people, uh, uh, when you look today compared to then, is, was it easier to, quote, manipulate public opinion? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. as, as you just mentioned, it's, things were much slower to change. And so people were conditioned, certainly after the war, to going to see movies week in and week out. They depended on the newsreels for their view of the... This is the first time anyone had ever seen, for example, if you were in the United States and you'd see newsreels of Paris or Berlin or Moscow, it was like, wow, these places exist for real. Even people had read about them, but they had never actually seen them. And keep in mind, they're also silent. Mm -hmm. Francisca Heimberger, you agree? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a way of showing people have read, read descriptions or hadn't read descriptions. These were more or less mythical entities for quite a lot of people who hadn't traveled greatly. It's one of the great effects of the First World War. It displaces a lot of populations, and then it also creates circulations of images through the, through the mass distribution of, of newsreels, for example. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So easier to, again, quote-unquote, manipulate public opinion, and uh, they're called mass media, after all, mm -hmm. And yet, and we mentioned it at the outset, the rise of, you could say, the individual in relation to the community, people moving from the country to the city, uh, and people who, after surviving the trenches, think, I'm not going to obey orders all the time. Yeah, that's one of the interesting questions. What happens to the armies immediately after the armistice, for example? Well, historians have looked at that in quite a lot of detail because until the end of the negotiations for the peace treaty six months later, um, practically the entirety of the soldiers that had been mobilized stay mobilized. And it becomes very difficult for the armies to maintain discipline because the necessity of war has been removed, but military discipline does still have to be maintained because you can't keep a standing army unless you've got a certain amount of discipline. And that's where the limitations of the individual who no, no longer feels under the obliga obligations of fighting for his country, but the army still has to maintain discipline. And it's one of those points where you can start to see that tension coming out. Dov Alphan, you come from uh, one of the few countries in the world where both men and women still today do military service and, yeah. a, and a long military service. Yeah. This idea of the individual comes first or the country comes first, uh, World War I's a turning point in that respect. Uh, absolutely, because uh, there is an interesting medium into that, and that is the Israeli kibbutz. Mm. Uh, it's the ideas of the Bolshevik revolution coming up to Palestine, and women, of course, are treated as equals. Yeah. Um, it's exactly like in the French Revolution, women were allowed to vote mm -hmm. uh, for, for a very short period and, and afterwards not. And, and so suddenly women were, you know, with weapons mm -hmm. and with tractors was mm -hmm. a kind of weapon mm -hmm. and, and symbol of, of, of power. Um, Afterward, you can see that men, exactly like, like the narrative of the silent film, men said, wait a minute, wh why do we allow women to drive a tractor and to decide which fields to... And, and, and there's a strong backlash against the kibbutz ideals of, of uh, gender equality. Mm -hmm. And you can see it in Israel, and it will, of course, propage all over the world, because there were an island in the Middle East, there was no question about that at all. Men ruled. Uh, but in this enclave, in this sort of utopia that mm. suddenly took form mm. uh, for a very short period also, women were equal and, of course, they were enlisted in the Haganah, in the main defense forces of Palestine, of Jewish Palestine. And when the state of Israel was born, then it was only natural that women were uh, enlisted in the army and some reached uh, very, very powerful um, positions. But there are very few female general, very few women general. Because again, the, 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 the men said, wait a minute, uh, okay, she's talented. She, what is she doing here in this table? We want to talk about, you know, chicks, etc." And, and you can see this in this very small microcosm that, that is Israel, exactly as you can see it later in all countries. And more countries. broadly, the, the, the notion of the individual vis-a-vis mm, yeah. -vis of the, the nations that they're citizens of. Reading are its first editions, you can see that the individual almost doesn't exist. Mm. And this is a liberal newspaper. Mm. Uh, if you read the VAR or the, the really Labour Party uh, uh, newspaper, then you can see that it's not a question at all. Mm. The question you're asking is a question of today. Then they had only one thing. 
and this is uh, the interest of the common interest mm. of the dream. We are dreaming something and we'll achieve it together. And therefore, the fact that you are sick or that you have small children or that you don't like this idea is not relevant. Mm. We are all together toward one goal. And, and this is how they thought, and this is what they thought. And, and, and in the end, you can see as well that a lot of countries wanted this, this model, uh, but they couldn't achieve it because individualism was suddenly growing up. It hadn't in Palestine. Mm. Curtis Young, the uh, individual uh, rises uh, also in the minds of political thinkers, because on the one hand, you have Marxists and mm -hmm. uh, who at the time of this, the Russian Revolution going on, believe in big blocks of uh, ma and materialistic views of history. Mm -hmm. And you have the influ growing influence of things like psychoanalysis and mm -hmm. uh, focusing more inwards on us as, again, people move from the country mm -hmm. to the city. Mm -hmm. And part of that comes out of, uh, out, of, out of World War I, given the fact that, for example, Sigmund Freud rethought his uh, understanding of, of the human psyche, given the fact, we, what we have to understand is World War I traumatized Europe. I mean, here, here, these are people who looked at themselves as, as, as descendants of the Greeks, the highest, the highest civilization, and suddenly they're into this, this moment of, of, of barbarity that's, that's, that there's no language for. And so what happens is, is we begin at that time to, to try and work out the role of the individual in the context of, of a state. This is one of the reasons why the Russian soldiers left, re, left the battlefield and, and went back and said, we're not going to participate in this, this elite thing that's going on among these, these guys. So people began to make those kinds of, we're beginning to try and make those kinds of decisions. And, and it, it resonates across the rest of, 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 of the 20, 21st century. Uh, of the 20th century. It resonates uh, across it. Uh, it. It becomes, World War I becomes really a, a, a very powerful postmodern, uh, cr creates a very powerful postmodern narrative where people are begin to, beginning to reassess their role uh, uh, in, in the state. So there's a backlash from uh, elder statesmen uh, in France. Uh, they, they denounced what they saw as dancing on the dead because yeah. there was so much partying that went on right after World War I. And what were they partying to? They were partying to a new form of music that was coming up, jazz. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is, this is one of the things that, that uh, these Americans brought with them. James Reese Europe uh, uh, had the most important military orchestra. He was a, a very important musician in New York. And when the 369th arrived, when they came off the ships in Brest, January 1st, 1918, they played the Marseillaise in a form of music people had not really heard before. We call it jazz. It was called ragtime, in fact. Jazz is a, is, meant ragtime, it meant blues, it meant swing. But it was it was a kind of a musical expression people had not heard before. James Reese Europe and his band took a tour of France uh, in in those first months mm -hmm. between uh, in the February and March uh, tour and and uh, uh, Nantes and et cetera et cetera et cetera, and and the, and this whole idea of jam it became it became the soundtrack, if you will. It became the soundtrack of of post World War One. Europe. Uh, all, all it was waiting for was the was the uh, advent of the radio. I want to thank you so much, Curtis Young. I want to thank as well Francisca Heimberger, Glenn Myrant of Alphon, and thank you for joining us here for this special year-end edition of the France 24 debate.